This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, 12 o'clock block, here on a given <sighs> Monday. <laughs> and we want to talk today about leadership. This is making leadership work. Uh, it's more than just leadership. It's the, all those characteristics that form up leadership and how you actually activate them and do leadership. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an occupation. It's a, it's a skill. It's something you learn. It's something that sometimes works. <laughs> Michael Troy, an executive in the hotel industry for a long time, uh, seen it all, done it all, seen the evolution <laughs> of the hotel industry, and seen, seen companies come and go and morph and, and consolidate and merge and all. He's seen it all. Michael, welcome to the show. Jay, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> So you're you're with uh, Star Starwood, well, but Starwood is getting acquired by Marriott, and you're the field marketing director. What does that mean? Well, actually, yeah, the the transition of um, Starwood being acquired by Marriott has actually been underway for more than a year now, and so a very exciting time bringing together uh, two large and very well recognized uh, hotel leadership companies uh, together. Now there'll be 30 brands under one umbrella, under the Marriott umbrella. So. Uh, very fortunate to be a part of that company, which will have over 6,000 hotels, over 1.5 million guest rooms around the globe. It's uh, quite, quite a, a big organization that uh, we look forward to having, you know, lead in the hospitality area. You know, when I was a kid, you know, we got in the car and, and, and drove down the East Coast and stayed at, uh, you know, little bungalows along the way. And it wasn't much tourism. That was a long time ago. Uh, but now tourism is so big, it's so everywhere, it's in every country, and you got from extravagant to not so extravagant, the industry has become huge. What got you into it? Well, I was fortunate to uh, be introduced to it through uh, a relative. I had an uncle who was a general manager of the, uh, that wonderful leisure location, the Pittsburgh Hilton. So uh, <laughs> I actually was introduced to that industry uh, when I went to, uh, actually to see one of my cousins be married and went to wonderful... Three Rivers, where the Pittsburgh Hilton was sort of situated. I don't. I believe it's not even a Pittsburgh. It's not even Hilton brand anymore. But I was introduced to it there. I, I ended uh, attending the University of New Hampshire in the hospitality administration program. One of those people, and then the opportunity to uh, work in Hawaii was afforded to me through a management trainee program. So Sheraton Corporation was actually headquartered in Boston on 60 State Street, and went down there and interviewed, and then had an opportunity to be offered a management trainee position in Hawaii. And, uh, that must have been I a happy thought, moment. Well, it was a stunning. I had never been west of Pennsylvania, as, <laughs> as, uh, as you can. So for me, it was a, it was a big opportunity, of something I had not expected to yeah. uh, be made available to me. And so I um, thought, okay, I'll, I'll try Hawaii. I'd never been here. And I thought maybe I'd do a year or six months or whatever and see how long it would be. And um, fortunate for me, I've, I've spent over 32 out of the last 36 years in Hawaii. So I've been very, very fortunate. So you came in the... 70s. 80s. 80, 80s 81, early 80s. 81. It was a management okay. machine at the, at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, the yeah. Pink Palace of the Pacific. Yeah, that must have been pretty exciting because, you know, it was, it was just coming around. There was a lot of action going on. My, my law firm was rep representing some of those deals. Uh, they, you know, my law firm represented Kenji Osano for a while. Well, there you go. Then, he, then they probably were very familiar with the, the acquisition that they, you know, from ITT Sheraton. They acquired those four properties in Waikiki along yeah. with Sheraton Maui. And then, of course, the palace in San Francisco. So, yeah, Kyoya as an organization here locally has been a true leader in, in hospitality. And for us to have such a diverse product, even within their portfolio, I mean, from the luxury property in the Royal Hawaiian, the historic Moana Surfrider, and then, of course, the Sheridan Waikiki, which has gone through several iterations of uh, accommodations being that of a, a group facility, but also now a very nice leisure destination property. Uh, right there, you know, on the prow of Waikiki Beach. So, uh, uh, you know, hats off to Kyoya. They have really, they could have, you know, taken the Moana Surf Ride on the Royal Hawaii, you know, historic properties. You know, you, there's a lot to maintain there. And I think the fact that they've got that commitment to let those two properties still be a nice the job icons. On the yeah. Nice job like, on I mean, they're, they're in pictures. They've been in Hawaii 5 0. They've been. You know, I, I think when you see a couple married right there on the ocean lawn at the Royal Hawaiian <laughs> Hotel with Diamond Head in the background, it, it doesn't get more storybook than that. <laughs> really storybook. Shades of Webley Edwards in the Moana Courtyard there with, uh, what is it, uh, um, Hawaii Calls. Yeah, well, there, there's that Hawaii Calls. At the, and then, of course, we had Del Courtney and the tea dance sure. that was done uh, in the Monarch Room for many, many years. You know, those things were sort of ending when I was just coming on board. 
Um, but, but we've had every, you know, in the Monarch Room, we had Andy Bumatai, we had uh, the Brothers Casimero, we had, you know, you name it. We had just an amazing diversity of guest experiences. Yeah, it really, did you know when you came out here that it would be like this? I mean, this, this, this was not always the mecca in, in hospitality that it is today. Uh, did you know that it would unfold this way? Well, I knew that the, the novelty of the destination was, was pretty significant. That, you know, when you said you had visited or you were going to or you'd been to Hawaii, everybody had a lot of questions. I mean, you know, some people who had no real concept of the place thought, you know, that there was uh, everything from one street light to grass shacks to whatever, and others who said, well, you know, Waikiki is so commercial, I just don't want to visit there, etc. And yet, when they do come out, uh, whether it be a neighbor island experience or, you know, visiting the island of Oahu, uh, I think they're always amazed at just how spectacular an experience it really is. Yeah, and that's because the industry builds this spectacular infrastructure and programs all over the place. It's really quite amazing what happens. You know, we, we live on the beach. We don't necessarily see it. But if you get into the track, if you get into the, that world, of the tourist uh, experience, it's really something here, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, when you look at what the industry does in generating revenues for the state of Hawaii. I mean, you're right; it's it's become uh, quite an industry, and it's it's been diversified further by things like vacation ownership, and you see that. And of course, now the shared industry, where you have people doing their own hospitality with Airbnb and VRBO and things like that. Yeah, and you you've had to track on all these things. It's been a a moving target the whole time. Yeah, I, I think the the landscape has come, become quite competitive, uh, and certainly in the last decade, I think more so than ever before, and, and a lot of that due, in fact, to, you know, changes in technology. I mean, when you look at how easy it is for someone to set up their own operation through, you know, the tools that have been made available from an Airbnb, where all you do is, you know, set up your listing and then payments and transactions and correspondence and sure. everything else is all handled electronically, uh, it makes it a lot easier. I mean, you didn't have the the ability to do those things, uh, you know, 10 years ago. But now, I mean, you can do it from your phone. It's easy to travel, isn't it? Easy to travel. Well, yeah, I wouldn't know if it's easy to travel. We've certainly, uh, the government's certainly making a, a little bit of a challenge, certainly internationally. I think we oh, in TSA. Hawaii could be, well, <laughs> TSA, but even the permitting process, not permitting, but the, uh, the process to get uh, visas and whatnot to come to Hawaii, uh, I think internationally I, we could do a lot to, to improve that, which would improve our fortunes a, a lot by having people that have not been to this destination come, which I think is always good to introduce it to, to an audience that hasn't been here. So where do we stand? I mean, where do we stand in the world? I mean, we stood in, in one, we, we had one kind of persona back in 1980. Um, we have another one now. What was it then? What was it now? Well, I think, uh, I think the mystique of Hawaii is, not, is still there for a, a good percentage of of people who have not been here. Uh, I think those that have been, you know, traveling the world and, and seen Hawaii, if you will, uh, still have not, if they have not taken an opportunity to visit a neighbor island and see the contrast to what's available on Oahu, uh, they certainly need to do that. Uh, but what's happened is, you know, the introduction of social media and the introduction of, of just Instagram in the last five years has made places that were once considered, uh, you know, hidden gems uh, available for everybody to see. I mean, I, I remember listening to a story about uh, a bridge about 90 minutes outside of Seattle that was a hidden gem forever, but because it became so popular on Instagram, <laughs> they're now going to tear it down because too many people are going up oh, and no. <laughs> trashing the place and everything else. And so I think I think the the good and bad of technology is, uh, you know, we're introducing things to people immediately. You know, you can tweet out a picture, you can tweet out an Instagram, uh, but you know, we have to make certain that as that message gets out there that we here in Hawaii can withstand that onslaught to the yeah. infrastructure. Market is changing. People's tastes are changing around the world. And as you say, travel is changing. So are we, are we um, still as much in cachet as we were before? Uh, and who's our competition uh, rising against us? That's a good question. I, I know the, the thing about competition is the places that we previously maybe did not consider competition suddenly have become known to, you know, who, who thought we'd compete against Costa Rica? Who thought Iceland would become a very popular destination in the last two years? You know, I, I think, as you mentioned, people looking for new experiences are out there uh, wanting to find out something that has not been seen before uh, or things that they just didn't believe they would add to their bucket list. And I think that... Uh, 
the ease of getting to Hawaii now is hopefully making it better for people to get here. But I think some of them just they, they like that far and out destination that you know nobody's been to. I think now you're trying to one up some somebody else when you look at what's been on their Facebook page or what's been in their Instagram feed and you know how can you do it better? I, I think you know technology has made it a little bit more competitive and the landscape as far as what the internet has done to you know compete against Hawaii, people are able to find out about destinations now much easier than they were before. You know the distribution system with retail travel agents being that knowledge base that you went to previously has now been you know put in the palm of your hand. Now it goes direct. Yeah, I mean you can do anything. You can you can find out about any destination. You can speak a language by just speaking into your phone. The new uh, Pixel earphones, which will do it automatically as you speak, the translation will go ooh, into your ear. I mean it's just, I mean it's remarkable the way the world is shrinking because people are less afraid to go into places of unknown because technology has made it easier. Yeah, and, and safer, I suppose, usually. Well, you, you'd like to think it is safer. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, uh, I think it's safer if you do your research. And I think the main thing is, is again, technology is making it so that you're able to read reviews from other people. I think people put a lot of faith into uh, UGC or user-generated content, whether that be an image, whether it be feedback, whether that be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a description of, of what the experience is like. And... You know, people just do a lot, tend to do a lot of research. People tend to engage more with others once they find out they've been to a, a place. You know, you, once you find out in somebody's Facebook feed that they've, they've gone ahead and visited a destination, you'll contact them. And, you know, if you know them or certainly, you know, hey, what was it like? Where did Word you stay? Mouth. What did you do? Word yeah. of mouth yeah. has become as, as strong a, a marketing tool as advertising. So how, how has the profile of the tourist, how has the profile of the tourist changed over recent years? I mean, what I hear you saying is the millennials have a, a leg up on this these days. They can handle and are comfortable with the technology. Um, I don't think we have, I guess we still have a fair amount of luxury properties out there, or at least expensive ones. Uh, how, how does the profile change this, you know, as a result of these factors? Yeah, I think, I think for us, the, the millennials certainly a good target audience to, to be uh, in focus, you know, keeping it on our, our radar screen. But when it comes to discretionary spend, I think there's still a lot yet to be captured from the boomer market and the Gen Y, Gen X, and, and that audience that is in some of their prime earning years that is going to take the time to go and, and travel. Uh, not that the millennials won't uh, be able to come and stay here, but I think they're also, the millennials are much more open to the shared uh, accommodations that we've talked about, things as an Airbnb and VRBO, because uh, that's what they're comfortable with. So you're all about demographics. And examining who that that <clears throat> that group is who might come here and also yeah. in Tahiti. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. So you, and this is an interesting, changing, kaleidoscopically changing answer there. Yeah, I mean it is. I mean the, you have to be able to, I think, have experiences that address what what it's going to be like for that that specific audience to to make certain that what you're putting out there is something that they want to experience when they're here. Um, whether it's an active traveler, and, and a lot of this you'll hear from the Hawaii Visitors Bureau, Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau, and, and those people from the HTA, how we're looking to find the right lifestyle experience for the visitor to Hawaii yeah. to find, whether Certain you're active. Adventure and adventure. Active, adventure. Exactly. And There's so many various audiences we can go after here in Hawaii, and uh, you know, technology lets us get a good handle on, on what exactly it is that they're looking, you know, the feedback and, and finding out more from them. Uh, their profiles, the open profiles that people have on uh, on social media. You can you can learn a lot about what people want to do. Yeah. Oh, I have so many questions. We'll never finish on time. This is uh, Michael York. Michael, <laughs> he's a field marketing director of uh, of um, um, what's it? Well, so now it's now Marriott it's, International. It's, so okay, Mar let's call it Marriott sure. for now. Sure. Um, and he covers not only Hawaii but also uh, also Tahiti and the, the French islands down there. It's an interesting combination of yes. things. And we're going we're gonna to ask him about the challenges and the problems. We're going to ask him um, what it's like to be an executive in this area these days and how we can get his job right after this break. You'll see. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii's Volunteer Chief Operating Officer and occasional host, and this is Minky. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online, web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. 
Give thanks to ThinkTech will run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so ThinkTech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thanksforthinktech.cosvox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii's 30-plus weekly shows, thank you, mahalo, and shishe for your generosity. Okay, we're back with Michael Troy. Uh, he is the field marketing director uh, of, um, I guess, Marriott now, as it works out. And he covers uh, Hawaii, which is 30 properties and three properties in, uh, in French Tahiti, which is all very interesting. And you got to go both places, right? Uh, definitely. Part definitely. of being an executive. Definitely want to get to <laughs> you got you to go check it out. Yeah. If you haven't been to French Polynesia, it's definitely worth the trip. <laughs> so um, uh, um, part, I guess part of being an executive in the hotel business is you get to spend time at hotels and you can get to enjoy the luxury. Am I right? Yes, I, uh, I've been very fortunate in the opportunity to, to, to stay in, in multiple brands uh, underneath our umbrella and then, of course, uh, multiple destinations, you know, both internationally as well as uh, domestically. And so it's amazing to see the, the, the breadth of our product, which, uh, like I said, goes from select serve brands, which is, are those that are sort of the um, things you might find in, in our loft or element or some of the Fairfield Inn or, or various products along those lines up to luxury with the Royal Hawaiian, our luxury collection, St. Regis, and now Ritz-Carlton, all under that umbrella. Ritz-Carlton, that's a name we heard last week. All right. Yeah. With number 45. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Stayed there. Must have had a good time. Were you involved in that? I don't know, but uh, keep the towel. We just want you happy. So there you <laughs> okay. go. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, is it, is, is you think it's evolving into more luxury or less luxury? Is, it, is, is the market looking for more economy or, or more high-end? I think, I think it's a, a little bit of both. I think what the consumers look for is for value, whether you're, whether you're uh, an entry-level consumer or someone who is able to go high-end. I think even at both ends of the spectrum, they, they want to make certain they're getting the value for the dollar that they're spending. So uh, consumers, are, again, are, are, are much more informed with regard to what it is they're going to buy uh, by the research that they're doing, and again, the expectations. When you stay at a St. Regis or a Ritz-Carlton, uh, you expect certain things to be delivered in that experience. And if you're not getting them, you're certainly going to voice it. And I think we need to be more cognizant of exactly what the consumer is saying, uh, even if that's in our entry level. If they're not liking something and they let other people know, as I mentioned, the influence of social media on people's buying uh, can be... Uh, very dangerous if you're not if you're not monitoring it. That's your job. You well, got to find out what they're thinking, how they're feeling, whether they like their experience or don't. How do you do that? How do you find out? That's a good question. I mean, you know, we we participate in the the major, you know, I think sort of the, the top three social media channels of Facebook, uh, Twitter, and of course Instagram, and and getting the feedback and the engagement from that from those customers. We monitor it. We have various tools that monitor customer sentiment about the. Uh, what it is they're saying about our brands, what it is they're saying about their experience within our brands, uh, what they're saying about the competition. You know, what is it that the competition is doing that we're hearing about when, when a Hilton or a Hyatt or somebody else is doing something? Is that something we're missing out on or is it something we haven't told them about? Uh, so yeah, social media has become very instrumental in, in helping us to understand sort of what the customer is seeking out in uh, their vacation experience. So if you're a field marketing, what is a field marketing director? Anyway? You know, I, I, I'll, I'll never it's claim. It's an impressive term. I, I, it is a great term, <laughs> but we're out there in the field marketing. It's, it's <laughs> a tremendous place to do it. So that's what we're doing. Okay, so but it's, it strikes me that it's more than placing ads. It's more than, you know, going to the media. It's more than creating the persona uh, as you would in, in all kinds of media, print and television and, and social media. Um, it's, but it's, it's the other end, too. You're, you're also involved in creating the experience that you want to market, right? It's not just marketing an existing phenomenon. It's changing the phenomenon, too. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a team, it's a team effort. When we work with everybody from revenue management on making certain that the pricing is in, is in the right area. We work with the, the people on the operations side with, with how, you know, it's great for, for us to come up, it's great for us to come up with, with an offer 
that we think will do well in the marketplace. But if it's hard to be fulfilled with everybody from the front desk to a spa to a restaurant, then it's not going to work. So we have to work with everybody from operations, revenue management, and then our, part, our, our distribution partners. If we want to put out a package that requires them to be involved in, you know, capturing information, uh, are kids coming? Uh, is it, you know, what is the what is the the makeup of that customer that's coming to our our resort? Uh, you know, we need as much information as we can to make certain we're matching up the right offer, the right property with the right guest. You ever walk around and say hi? You ever, you know, check them out when they come out of the restaurant or catch them in the lobby and say, you know, how, how's it going for you? Yeah, my, my job probably doesn't allow me the, the opportunity to do that as often as I'd like to, but, you know, we have operations staff. We have actually uh, a sort of a lobby concierge that is engaged in, 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 you know, what is the customer experiencing? How's it going? How's everything uh, that you're experiencing here at the property? Uh, we even have it certainly in Waikiki where you need to have that in, in uh, multiple language Oh, capabilities yeah. because of, you know, we still have a strong audience from Japan that, that loves the destination. We want to make certain their experience is top notch and, you know, like I said, get that feedback. And I, I again, a big uh, kudos goes to our, our, our team, operations team, whether it be guest service agents, the front desk, the, the bellman. They are talking with guests at a time when they're probably, you know, willing to say anything. You know, yeah. when you're walking up to your room, I can't believe we're here and this and that. Well, what is it you want to experience right here? What is it you want to do? And yeah, the same yeah. when you're checking in, same yeah. when you go and ask about activities. Yeah, so yeah. that team, I think, does a great job in, in making certain that they can get as much intelligence on what that customer wants to have and then feeds it back to, uh, you know, our executive then team. you've got to get it. Yeah. Your group we has gotta to get, get it. Yeah. You know, Michael, they didn't see enough pictures about what the beach is like or what the pool is like. Okay, then we need to we need to upgrade our, our visual messaging yeah. so that we can we can address those things. They're doing in social media, not just on the website, but also in social media. These are the things that they want to see. So we want to make certain we put that out there. How about the Chinese? Um, what what do you need to do for the Chinese, and what are you doing for the Chinese? And is there a, a gold mine there in the Chinese? I think it's still early. I think it's a very nascent uh, uh, market segment to be going after. I think the lift, the the visa process still to come here. Uh, is a little bit uh, long. And I think, you know, from a cultural standpoint, we went through some great cultural training when uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, when it became evident that there was going to be that growth in the Chinese market. But it really hasn't materialized to the point where they become such a big part of our market mix. Uh, you know, I still believe that the biggest part, obviously, is our, our domestic audience, our Japan audience. Our Oceana, you know, people from, we've had increased uh, air seats available made now from Hawaiian, you know, to the Australian, New Zealand markets. You know, Canada is still a very big market for us. Europe, we're still a long ways away. You know, until Lyft coming here, you know, if, if there ever is a nice nonstop that's put in play when yeah. you can, you know, bypass and make it easy for that, that market segment to get here, then... You don't have a lot of control over Lyft, though. No. I mean, for example, I read yesterday's paper. There was a there was a carrier, a small carrier, that was coming directly out of Las Vegas. They they they're folding. Yeah, Legion is uh, Legion is no longer uh, doing their their route. They, their last flight was just last month. So uh, we, we have a lot of hopes that Southwest will come in and and bring in to the marketplace some some new access points where people will be flying from. You know, uh, the West Coast is still. Certainly those gateway cities are our biggest cities and, and where we like to focus. And we've got some nice nonstops from the East Coast where, you know, out of Newark, out of Atlanta. Uh, but we'd love to have new carriers, you know, open up markets to us that we have not had a chance to sure. in the past. Can, can you encourage them? Can you say, look, United, we need another couple of flights here. You know, we have the rooms, we have the, we have the, the, the infrastructure. Why don't you send some more people? Well, United's already doing that. At the end of December of this year, United will introduce a, a significant number of, of new uh, gateways to Hawaii and, and more flights, not only to Oahu, but to the neighbor islands as well. So we're very fortunate to see uh, certain carriers, legacy carriers like United, are, you know, still have a, a lot of a commitment to this, this destination. Uh, and I, again, I applaud the things that Hawaiian Airlines has done, both internationally and domestically, to, to make it work. And uh, certainly for Bokam Aina that want to travel to other places on the mainland, Hawaiian has, you know, uh, really broadened their reach. But uh, there's not much, I think we in the hospitality, thing, we, we love the airlines and uh, we hope the airlines love us. We have those great partnerships, but uh, there are other things that go on on the government side with regard to uh, gates at the airport. I think those are going to be the biggest challenges if we, we grow 
uh, not enough air seats and not enough people. room to move planes and things around. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I think there's some things, in, and you don't want to have planes flying over Waikiki Beach at three in the morning because I don't think that's going to make it enjoyable yeah. for anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you um, about that, about the community. I mean, is the, the Hawaii community used to be, in my, my opinion, a little more aloha than they are now and cared a lot about, um, you know, welcoming tourists, uh, Ikomamai, all that. Um, you know, now it's, it's Waikiki. I don't go to Waikiki. They can do what they want in Waikiki. I don't care. Um, how does this affect the situation? Um, and do you feel you're getting enough support, so to speak, from the local community and the government. And let me fold one other thing in there. Oz Stender, a former trustee of the Kamehameha yes. Schools, was sat on that chair a few months ago, and he said, too many tourists. You have to, you have to make a limit. Uh, so I'd like to ask you about that, too. Well, I think that's a, uh, all, all one big question. I think uh, certainly it is a concern that the, the tourism industry be able to maintain the infrastructure to accommodate any sort of growth so that it is a pleasurable experience, not only for those visiting, but those that, that work and live here. You know, I mean, I, I strongly believe that the opportunities to grow the neighbor island experience would be wonderful uh, by having nonstop flights. I think the, the multiple island visitor that used to come in the 70s and 80s doesn't want to do that as much now because it's a pain in the neck to go through TSA and, and, you know, take four hours out of your day to do an inter-island flight. Not that it's going to be that on the average, but I've heard of some experiences where that can, can be the case. <laughs> and for local people, too, by the yeah, way. Yeah, no, we, well, it, it's, it's been a challenge. So uh, I'd like to think that there, there is a balance that can be maintained in hospitality uh, that allows for us to, you know, have the jobs, have the careers, but also highlight and, and appreciate the culture that, that exists here. You know, you talk about Ikomomai and you talk about uh, the care of the Aina and things like that. And I do believe many of the companies in the hospitality industry do a lot to give back to the community. And I, I firmly believe that from, from Marriott and from even from Starwood that that was a big part of it. You know, the industry, the charity industry walk that we do uh, annually uh, gives quite a bit of money to uh, local charities in an effort to to help out, and I think, again, from an employment standpoint, uh, the huge hospitality is huge, and, and they've worked hard to bring in the youth that are interested in getting the hospitality. Uh, I think the youth that want to be a part of this industry, you know, there's no better testing ground for, for learning hospitality than, than Hawaii. I mean, if you can learn the industry here, if you have the capability of speaking a foreign language, that, that will certainly go light years into helping you to, to travel anywhere you want. The great thing about our industry is, is, is that it doesn't just exist in Hawaii. It's a global industry. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is a great, great career. It sounds like you're really into it and you really love what you do and all. But I wonder if um, we could identify the kinds of characteristics that would make somebody in, in the hospitality, in one of these hotel chains, uh, a success. Uh, what, do you need, what do you need to have in your kit bag? bag to do what you've done. Yeah, I, th I think if, you, if you're going to reach into your quiver and, and make sure you have all the right things, uh, you know, uh, it's an industry that, that is no two days are the same in hospitality. <laughs> I mean, uh, everybody asks me, you know, what about, you know, are weekends different than, you know, every day is a Tuesday. We, 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 we face changes every day based upon uh, people's moods, uh, holidays that may be international, may be local, may be national holidays. You know, I think if you're going to be in this industry, you have to have uh, the, the will to be flexible. Uh, I was fortunate to have, as a management trainee, learned the different uh, areas of, of focus in hospitality. I was in accounting for a while. I was in food and beverage, food and beverage control, restaurant management, banquets and catering. Uh, I was a property manager, a director of sales, a director of marketing. Then I got into the digital side. So. What's and it great wasn't about, always for Starwood and Marriott. It was well, it was well, pretty much always Starwood and right? with Marriott. Okay. Yeah, I, I was right. fortunate to, to, that Starwood uh, allowed me the opportunity to, yeah, to, to enter into the various aspects of the business. And I think for those that are, are willing to get into the industry, having the flexibility, uh, having the, the wherewithal to want to, to wanna learn, uh, and then the soft skills. I mean, we, we, it's great to have an education that, that knows about the financial side of it and, and certainly the technical side of, of doing things, but the soft side of this business is, is critical. How you network, how you deal with people, how you listen, how you communicate. Things that really don't show up on your resume, you know, it's more that people are going to say that you do this well, you don't do it well, but you, you can't really 
list it down there. Uh, you've got to show them down both yeah. and, and, and horizontal. All horizontal. Yeah. You know, the, the people to me that are the, you know, on the firing line every day, our front desk people, our bellmen, our housekeepers, you know, they are what make me a success because I make a promise, they fulfill it. I mean, that's the big part of, of what that's all about. Yeah, so yeah. we're very, very fortunate to have uh, some well-trained, some very understanding, and some long-term employees within our employee. Uh, you know, the Royal Hawaiian and, and the Moana Surfrider, for instance, they probably average, you know, 10, 15, 20 years on average, some of these employees. That's, a, that's not just a, a, a job. That's a career and a commitment. Yeah. So that's pretty special. Well, speaking of careers and commitments, I mean, where are you in the arc of your career? It sounds like you're in you're in pretty deep by this time after all this time. Yeah. Where does it go from here? Well, I'm I'm really fortunate, as I mentioned, because uh, I, I just moved into this new role to be the uh, senior account director for the Hawaii region for Mary International, and we'll have those 30 properties or the, the multiple. Not every property is, is going to be a part of the program that I manage, which is field marketing, because we have some franchise that uh, run a little bit different, but. Uh, my opportunity now is to continue to grow, uh, you know, the integration of those brands. Uh, with uh, Starwood, I had just four brands to worry about. We had our luxury collection, St. Regis, Sheraton, and Weston. Now we've got Marriott, Courtyard, Ritz-Carlton, uh, their brands all integrating in with our brands. And uh, so it'll be a, a new experience in how we get out to, their, to that audience. And that audience that has been... In, uh, you know, numbered now somewhere near 20 million loyalty members between the two companies. Wow. So, you know, new ways to go and, and research that audience and see how we can, you know, get more of them to come to Hawaii. And, and loyalty and the use of loyalty points, how do we get those people to, you know, if they're going to redeem points, we want you to redeem them here. Come, come and stay in Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, very exciting. And, and all kinds of new hotels, too, new, new brands, mm -hmm. uh, new, new properties, all that. I, I wonder, what do you, you have any thoughts about what's going to happen in Lanai? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, 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 I thought that, and he was part of Island Air, too. Didn't he still own one-third yeah, of it? Yeah. So I thought he would have kept the airline. You know, the Four Seasons uh, branding that they have put on those properties, we previously actually had them as luxury collection properties back under the Starwood management way back when. Um, I don't know if he's going to expand hospitality there or, or not. I, I do believe that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a destination island that you could do a lot with. Certainly agriculture was a big part of its makeup for so many years. Uh, I think the opportunity to do things in agricultural uh, with regard to uh, food and beverage, I mean, because this, this farm-to-table opportunities and things like that, certainly I think uh, taking those experiences, you know, green tourism, maybe this ecotourism that's tied to Lanai, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's golf, there's other things, but the infrastructure itself, if they're going to take on a bigger audience, they need to add, you know, more diverse things to do, and they need to be able to manage it well. Yeah, yeah. And, and what about uh, new, new brands? I mean, coming from Asia, for example, Shangri-La, a great brand, really, around the world, everywhere you look, except in the U.S. Uh, is there any chance that uh, Shangri-La could come here? No, I, I think every brand will look at this destination. I think the challenges that they face in coming to Hawaii is the, the expense of a new build is quite, quite high. And so if there's an opportunity for a conversion, if you see a destination or a location where, you know, the, I think we've had like Mandarin or used to be at the Kahala or we, or we do have, you know, a neighbor on opportunity. You know, I think Maui is becoming... Uh, much easier to get to, you know, with flights. And if they get international flights into Maui in the future, which I think would be a tremendous opportunity to grow that, that destination in, in the right way, where it it's, doesn't have to be a huge volume, but you can bring in a higher end audience if that's what you're seeking, uh, that could be good. But, you know, I think Hawaii also is, is it, it's reaching its limits in a few places where you can build new product and a luxury product, uh, that, that's, a, that's a challenge. You have to make certain you have the right, the right audience to buy into that. You know, with your arc in the company as, as now merged, um, gee whiz, uh, and you've had a long career in Hawaii, you know, to me, that's the center of so many things. Um, will you stay in Hawaii as, as we go forward here? What do you think you'll be in? Where is the headquarters of Marriott Washington? So uh, beautiful Bethesda, Bethesda, Maryland. Yeah, uh, okay. No, I, I have no, no wishes to hang out at our corporate offices <laughs> and uh, uh, prefer to stay home here in, in Hawaii. I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, I've uh, raised three children here. And uh, no, it's, uh, 
It's a great destination. It's a great place to live. It's, it's certainly from a hospitality experience. Like I said, you can work in hospitality anywhere around the world, but if you've, been, if you've learned it here or if you've experienced it here, there's, there's nothing like the hospitality. Yeah. And it is truly, you know, you, there are ways that people say the spirit of Aloha has been lost or it's been somewhat uh, tainted. Uh, there is still, I think, a commitment from employees and, and from those in the business here that's unrivaled with other destinations. And people are still learning from how we deliver hospitality. So my, my last question for you, Michael. And there's camera one over there. That's those are the people. Okay, oh, okay. that's the right over okay. there. Ah, there it is. It, the red light just went on. Okay, that, that's okay. camera one. Okay. There you go. My last question is so so we have a student at the Scheidler College. We have a student at the Tim School, uh, which I guess is these days is part of the Scheidler College. Okay. Um, what's your advice to him, you know, or her? I mean, it, it, how how do you enter the, the? Do you get into a training program? Do you get into it here somewhere else? How do you point your brain cells to have a good career in, in hospitality? Well, if you're going to enter the hospitality industry, uh, again, I think it's always good if you can get into uh, a management training program where it's made available. Uh, I know that in the case of Marriott, they just flew uh, a thousand candidates for management training programs to uh, Texas and interviewed a thousand people for placement in the upcoming year. So. Opportunities are out there. I think if you can get in and learn the business and learn the various aspects of the business, as I mentioned, there is no limitation to what you can do in hospitality. If you like accounting, if you like management, if you like dealing with guests, if you, if you are creative, if you are technical, so many opportunities are afforded to you in this business that you, you don't need to be shoeboxed into one thing. Uh, I started, as I mentioned, as a trainee. I went into the various uh, areas, uh, food and beverage, and also accounting and things like that. But I ended up in the digital side. Who, who would have thought? I, I didn't think I'd end up in the digital side. But uh, I, I love it because it's, it, it is never the same two days in a row. Never underestimate the power of technology in go. any industry. No. It, 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 there's so much. It's all in the palm of your hand. Yeah. It's crazy. Thank you. Jake, Michael thank you Troy. So Appreciate it. Wonderful to have you Thanks. here.